Welcome to the Higher Ed Geek Podcast. I'm Dustin Ramsdell, and every week I'm having conversations with influential higher ed leaders about the work they're doing, the impact they're making, and how you too can better implement technology to support student success. Conversation today, I think it'll be a really interesting one. I don't feel like we've like deliberately spent time on just sort of talking about making people-focused, data-driven decisions to support student success. It always sort of kind of filters in or kind of has an influence on the conversations, what we're talking just kind of holistically about that and strategy around that and utilizing, you know, kind of integrated tech stacks and tools to uh, really help uh, institutional leaders do their best work supporting their students. So uh, we will start as we always do. Uh, Kurt, if you want to introduce yourself uh, briefly, and then we'll talk more about what your organization does and the topic of today. Yeah, really appreciate it, Dustin, and I'm happy to be on uh, the podcast here. Uh, my name is Kurt, and uh, my background is uh, educator turned consultant. Uh, I've spent time in higher education, elementary education, and high school, so really the full spectrum, and uh, have now m- found myself uh, amidst IT and data uh, technologies. Yeah, I mean, it's always exciting because I mean, like, that's kind of my story as well as like coming from a formal, traditional, like on campus higher education background and really feeling inspired and pulled towards working and like education technology. Um, so really folks who like get into like consulting and stuff too, like how can we kind of systemically sort of support and supplement and augment the work that's happening um, on campuses across the country and across the world. Uh, so uh you know, in, in terms of the way that you are leveraging your skills and experience to do that, uh, your organization resultant that you work at, if you could explain briefly what it does just for folks who aren't aware. Yeah, we really meet organizations at the intersect of people, technology, and process. We serve organizations of all different sizes, both public and private sector. My practice in particular is really spearheading how to bring resultants services and skills, expertise into the education sector, really early care education through post-secondary education. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like we're in a moment across the board where, you know, it's just digital transformations happening or just a lot of like scrutiny. I mean, changing dynamics. I feel like there's like pandemic funding as like sort of a, an aspect in all this. And then, yeah, but it's even just the, I guess, tacit acknowledgement of like, higher education exists in that whole ecosystem. It is its own ecosystem, but like, you know, yeah, the, the investments that you're making or dynamics that are changing in early childcare education space, you know, can sort of have ripple effects. So it is important, at least like, you know, maybe just be aware, you know, grab a couple of, you know, headlines or articles every once in a while, but certainly organizations like yourself who can like leverage that point of view or perspective or uh, sort of expertise is certainly helpful. But Centering on higher education, this is a big question, so take it as you will, uh, but we'll kind of start really big picture and try to start to kind of narrow in here. But what do you feel like are some of the like key analytics that you're seeing or you're sort of emphasizing or talking a lot about for people-focused, data-driven decisions that support college student success? Yeah, that's a, a fantastic question. And, you know, it is, as you mentioned, uh, a really exciting time to be in technology and in data with just the the huge interest in AI and machine learning. It's it's exciting and it's it can be a cautionary time too. And we really should scrutinize these technologies as with anything as we bring them into our organizations and, and stop to ask it questions and ask ourselves questions for how do we best leverage these platforms. Uh, It can be really tempting, especially in the midst of times that we're in to hit the easy button and and to say, I will buy that. Yes, do it. Done. Check. Not so fast, we say, right? We lead with this, you know, this notion that yes, data is valuable. It's critical, but it is not the whole story or the entire story. And it will never replace the human experience and the institutional knowledge and expertise that humans bring into the conversation about data. So I've said so many times that the power of data analytics and data dashboards is not in the technology, it's in the conversation that happens around it. And so for higher education in particular, we can't lose sight of those, those historical experiences, the, the cultures, the climates, the geographic boundaries, the politics, small p politics that go into uh, making informed decisions. But certainly data gives us a, a kind of a smoke signal or a trail to follow 
And we would be wise to invest in building our data literacy and really thinking as a leader, how do I leverage data as a tool, just like any other resource that a leader has at their disposal. But we're, we make it a point to say, this is not a easy button. This is not a silver bullet to solve all problems. It, in all actuality, to do it right, to do it well, it does take a lot of work and a lot of intentionality. Really appreciate your perspective and what you're saying, because like, it could be that idea of like you you have a lot of higher institutions, I think, are very data rich organizations. They have a lot of like touch points with students or certainly with digital tools, just a lot of kind of breadcrumbs that they can follow. But I think if you're doing it, you know, with a lot of blind spots, like you could be making sort of assertions or decisions and things that aren't going to be the most effective. So that idea of being really intentional and inclusive with those conversations that are happening around data, I think can help you to get to a point where, you know, it is like very people focused and, you know, you're, you're leveraging that data to inform how you're starting things, how you might be stopping things, like how you're adjusting things. You have to almost like be open to like wherever it could lead you. And that, especially if you have like a diverse group of people coming together, you know, if you're getting like the student perspective, faculty, staff, and other folks that could lead you in places where it's like, yeah, I mean, if I was just looking at this alone in my office, I probably would have been, you know, making decisions anecdotally based on my own college experience or something else. There's definitely a lot of dynamics that play. And it is like interesting where I feel like we're moving beyond like, uh, you know, this is maybe like 10 years ago, I feel like, but just sort of this heyday of just sort of like, you know, data will just solve all our problems or anything. And I think we're at least now where we're so awash in data and we're at least getting a lot more thoughtful with how, I don't know, we're utilizing it or those conversations that we're having. So for institutions that are, you know, thoughtfully utilizing their data to make, you know, informed decisions that are people focused and everything, how do you see, you know, with the kind of proliferation of digital tools that have happened in higher ed, like, how do you see like a really integrated, robust tech stack supporting this work? Because I think that's the idea that you could have all these sort of disparate pools of data or things that maybe aren't working together. Like, how do you see that kind of integration supporting this work? Yeah, that's a perfect question to where we find ourselves in personally doing the work that I do. It's again, it's that intersection of people, process, and technology. And it starts with an awareness of all three, right? From a people perspective, an awareness of what do I think and feel about the data that I have, that I see, that I use? What are the systems that I get it from? How is that collected? And what are the processes that I use to exchange data between systems or maybe divisions within the institution itself? And there's been such a proliferation of, in particular, you know, predictive analytics and this use of models for recruitment or retention. And while there are a lot of really positive things about that, there's a lot of things to scrutinize. And so it first starts with just like have an awareness of your current attitude and feeling about data, and then just begin to get an understanding and appreciation for these different data sources. It's a process, just like with anything of maturity, right? I often talk about this maturity scale of kind of going from maybe more of a, a disposition of looking at data uh, to uh, in a descriptive way, right? To tell you kind of what's happening, who, where, how much, how often. There's a maturity that has to happen to get to the that predictive and prescriptive level, right? And so there's a level of just a, a, a of, of literacy, as I mentioned. But I, I guess to to answer your question, the end state is is a full integration where you're leveraging data to help make decisions, but not be the decision maker right, help you set the stage for having an intentional, robust discussion about what you're seeing from the data. And again, that practice of how do we talk about data and how do we challenge our assumptions about what the data is saying in a healthy and productive way is what ultimately full integration looks like. What it does not look like is, and so often as happens, Institutions go out, they pick a product, they pick a vendor for predictive analytics, they install it, put it on autopilot, let it do its thing. And, and there's this assumption sometimes that big data is neutral and it doesn't have prejudice, and that's not true. Every model is shaped by human judgment. Predictive does not mean it's error-free and it's judgment. 
And just like we challenge ourselves and one another with, well, tell me your thinking. How did you get there? Show your work. How did you arrive? We have to do the same with our data models and our IT systems. We can't just say, well, the data said so, so it's right. That's where we get into where we get these errors, but we also unintentionally replicate barriers or inequalities that have existed with human interaction, and they are just replicated in the data models. And so full integration is just a heightened awareness. Really, it's critical thinking. What's this saying? What's this mean? How does this fit within our experience? And how did it get there? What constraints did I put in the data model? Right? What historic data was used to make these predictions? When should we use this predictive model? When should we not use this predictive model? And, you know, that I could go on and on, but I'll stop myself short there. I could feel myself going on a tangent. But, um, you know, when I was an admissions counselor, I would tend to look at that likelihood to enroll statistic. And looking back now, and I tell clients now, don't ever use that in a decision for admission. Never, ever. Because you'll overlook the applicant. And you kind of get used to and kind of get, I got lazy. I'm like, well, okay, likelihood to enroll. Let's just go and push them through. Hey guys, it's Zach here, founder of Enrollify with some huge, huge news. So I am ecstatic to announce that Element 451, the AI-powered all-in-one CRM platform for higher education, has acquired Enrollify. Back in 2019, I approached Tony Frega, the CEO of DD Agency, with an idea. Tony's a good friend of mine, and so I said, dude, let's build a next-generation media hub for higher ed marketers and admissions professionals. As a lover of media, I was just so impressed by how the attention landscape was changing and how brands like The Skim and The Hustle and Morning Brew began to eat up market share from more traditional publications. And I thought there was an opportunity to build something similar, uh, you know, obviously a lot smaller, but similar in the niche, but oh so important arena of higher education marketing. Tony and the leadership at DD were gracious enough to allow me the time and the space to ideate on this half-baked idea and then launch Enrollify's first ever content asset, which was, you guessed it, the Enrollify podcast. Since then, Enrollify has grown into one of the most trusted resources for candid higher education marketing content in the industry, and we've welcomed industry giants like Terry Flannery, Jamie Hunt, Allison Tercio, Eddie Francis, Dave Kibbles, and Jeremy Tears, just to name a few, into our network of creators. As we started thinking about the next chapter of Enrollify's life, it became clear that it was time for Enrollify to scale. I'm pretty good at building things, but scaling things is a skill I'm still working on. When thinking about who could take Enrollify to the next level, I felt as if artists, Mallory, and the leadership at Element 451 were uniquely qualified to inherit the brand. Element has actually been a part of Enrollify's story since the very beginning. They were our second podcast sponsor ever. They have invested in almost every experiment that we've ever run. They ship product faster than any other ed tech company I've ever met. And perhaps most importantly, artists and the leadership team invest seriously in thought leadership and education. Building Enrollify has been the most rewarding experience of my professional career to date, and I couldn't be happier to collaborate with the Element team as we seek to take Enrollify to the next level. And don't worry, I'm not going anywhere just yet. You are not through with my lovely voice just yet. Um, but if you've found any value in Enrollify over your years of tuning into our content or watching our videos, it would mean a lot if you could share a kind word or two about how Enrollify has helped inspire you or helped teach you something new about marketing on social media. It would really, really, really mean a lot to, to the whole Enrollify and Element team, but to me personally as well. So if you've gotten any value of any of the content that we've ever produced, share a quick story or, or a quick thought about us on social. That would be wonderful. Well, thanks so much for being here, guys, and get ready. We've got so much in store that I can't wait to share with you all soon. But for now, back to the podcast. The idea of like these models or just whatever tools and different things you're using like require maintenance like kind of you know keeping a close eye on sort of like you know how they're set up and how you're uh, utilizing things and because it's even like it's you know there's a fork in the road of like you're using analytical tools and trying to leverage like automated things or human like you know automation obviously is like a formula that's making assumptions and decisions or like even like you said if you're sort of like looking at things as being infallible even though it's like well no i'm still the one like making the decision or doing the thing or whatever it's like but yeah you can't just look at the output with no scrutiny whatsoever yeah it can be where it's like you look at it and you're like cool yep that makes sense and that's you know 
that's good. And we're going with that or just like disregarding it and being like, but it poured out. We're not going to go that way for whatever reasons. But um, so, yeah, I think that's really, really good advice. And I think helpful. Yeah. For the stage where we're at. And I guess that's one like brief follow up because I think you're, you're talking about like, you know, oh, you go out there, you pick a tool and you just sort of like put on an autopilot. But like in terms of like choosing tools and utilizing tools, I'm imagining in terms of like the integration of tools. So you might have like a lot of disparate tools and how do they play together, which could be fine. But then like, what's your viewpoint on trying to get institutions? Because I think historically, School of Business has their own thing. School of Arts and Sciences has their own thing. Like, do you have like a strong opinion on like, no, the whole school should w- use one CRM or, you know, whatever, or it's like, oh, it doesn't matter as long as they all play nice together. Like, do you have a viewpoint on that? Because I, I feel like that that tech stack integration has been on my mind a lot lately. Yes, that's a great point. We, you know, we, I don't want to say we've solved that in K-12, but in K-12, we work a lot with the, the EdFi technology suite. You know, it's a standard data data standard, but it comes with an API operational data store. And what it does, it allows a school district or a state to have all their different tools and their platforms, but they play in the sandbox together. So especially when you think about different divisions or even different agencies, you know, they all have their data systems or their platforms for a reason. Sometimes homegrown and it's their baby. Sometimes it's just a favorite and they just do not want to get rid of it. Okay, that's fine. My opinion would be fine so long as we can agree on interoperability standards. We can agree on that while we get to pick our tool, we should make sure that tool could integrate through an API, through a data standard to centralize our data so we can really get a 360 degree view of our student. Great. Just so long as that can be accomplished, I say, have have your tools, have your products. If a school of business has their software because they want to do that to reach out to prospective students, awesome. Let's just add that data to what the enrollment office has so we can enrich it for both us and for the school of business and their efforts, right? And that can be accomplished with data solutions like what I described, you know, uh, through those APIs, those data stores, data lakes, right? Large amounts of data flowing back and forth. The challenge is standardizing that and putting that in similar terms. So there is interoperability between all of those tech stacks. And that requires not just those inside of the institution, but also the vendors behind those products being willing to incorporate those endpoints and share data Oftentimes, you know, clients will buy these products or these platforms and they go to share the data and they realize they don't own the data. They don't have access to it. And so that's just a learning when you when you go for those types of products and tech stacks. Yeah. Flexibility has been this action word that's come up in a lot of the conversations about higher ed tech lately. So it's curious kind of your perspective on like stuff like that, where it's like, it's fine if you've got a lot of different tools, as long as they play nice and, you know, they're interoperable and flexible is yeah, it'd be that tragedy of like school of business has their thing and they're just sort of like an island, you know, off from everything else. And yeah, you you would assume that like the enrollment office is sort of serving everybody. So they've got that one sort of like tie that binds everything else. And then other schools could have their own, you know, systems that they prefer to use for their for their needs. But some degrees of autonomy are are good, right? There's different flavors, different things. Everyone has their preferences, but we have to get an agreement that it's in the best service of our students if we can modularize these products and these platforms and come up with a consistent data standard and way to share that data. Yeah. The next question I want to ask you, so just building on this, like, does any other pieces of advice that you would give the staff members at institutions, campuses all across the country who are trying to improve their efforts here? Yeah. So I kind of want to maybe narrow the the conversation down a bit too. I I mentioned this proliferation of predictive models, right? Particularly around recruitment and retention. Now, these algorithms have been around since the 70s, right? And, you know, uh, like I was saying before, they later found out that that was discriminating against women in uh, medical school admissions. So algorithms are not new. The fact that they are not error-free is not news to anyone. 
but we've gotten into this, uh, again, this easy button mode, and we just have to kind of stop, look, and listen, and, and make sure we're making the right decisions and applying it at the right ways in our recruitment and our uh, retention efforts. So one thing I would say is that when you're looking at a vendor solution outside, or if you're building it within, uh, make sure that you have a solution that you can easily trace its decision-making process. Don't look for like a black box solution where you really don't understand how the data is is leveraged to, to create the predictive outputs that it's generating. Look for that logic tree, look for that decision-making pieces. And when you're building that model, pay close attention to the constraints that you're applying because those constraints will have huge impacts in the outputs that you have in what the data is telling you. In addition to the constraints you put on your data, just recognize the limitations you have based on the data you have available. So for example, when we look at, we have a campus analytics solution, and when we look at our student retention module, we have an element in there for belonging and integration. But when we heat map how strong those data sources are, they're typically the weakest data sources are non-existent. And so, well, we could do something about that and find a way to look at belongingness, peer-to-peer -peer belongingness or academic belongingness, point in time, longitudinal, and try to enrich that data set. Or we can recognize we just don't have great data there, but we as practitioners know that's a strong data point. Let's run the model and just kind of keep that limitation in mind for when we see the outputs. So those are just a couple of things that I would say as far as like best practice, I, you know, I... I mentioned in the admissions process that you know it's it's not recommended to use that likelihood to enroll to decide whether or not to admit someone. In our module, we create kind of a, a an output that looks at uh, price elasticity. So we look at it in terms of matriculation, going from enroll, you know, admitted to matriculated, and we look at the financial aid, but not need based aid. That's another thing I would say. Do not let predictive models determine need-based aid. There's so many colleges are doing that. And what we're doing is we're bringing students in at the brink of uh, financial disaster, right, with just enough to get them to matriculate with need-based aid. But So our model just looks at institutional-based aid to kind of help improve that, that retention module. But the last thing I guess I'll say on this is when you when you think about these optimization solutions, right? That's what they are. They're optimizing decision making. You have to ask yourself, like, who is it improving the outcomes for? Right? So when you think about this optimization around prediction of recruitment or retention, optimization helps give you a better strategy for um uh, engaging in different things to give you a better outcome. But what type of outcome? Better for who? And sadly, the story is often it's for the betterment of the university to boost its enrollment numbers. And then you see a cliff or a huge impact on its retention because what they did is they looked kind of singularly at boosting enrollment and matriculation at the front end, but without regard to can this student you know, be retained, are they a great fit, all of those other factors, and then it takes a hit on the back end. And that's not great for the student, or for the university for that matter. So um, we just have to, to keep those things at the forefront. Let's say. That, was a, that was a laundry list of things, uh, probably a little bit disjointed. But uh, I think the theme kind of comes through of just be awake when when dealing with these things yeah, right yeah. well no and i mean and that's always just like you know having very knowledgeable people like yourself on you know like they've just got a lot of great tips and tricks and insights and advice and everything and i think you know a takeaway that i'm sort of processing right now is like you know trying to think a little bit more long term than maybe you you would be like certain you know decisions that are made or you know uh, like you said like the way that certain models might be set up are just sort of like kind of goose the numbers just short term and sort of have people be satisfied. But it's like, it's not really like having that student set up for long term success or the institution because like, cool, you admitted a bunch of students who maybe they matriculated, but then if they just like, you know, dropped out a semester or a year in, then it's like, you've really done nobody any good. But yeah, so I mean, it's super 
super helpful stuff, I'm sure, just for folks as they're thinking through all this and maybe kind of picking up all the pieces and processing after, you know, this recording this like early, mid-October-ish fall recruitment or, you know, the enrollment and semester is underway. So like people kind of try to discern how they did and everything and why things happened and all that. So, yeah. It's perfect timing. Where I've seen predictive models leveraged really well is when they're used to inform, like, where should we spend our time, effort, and energy? Or what dosage should we would we administer to certain bands or segments of students in the recruitment process, right? Uh, based on this likelihood score, if you will. There's also this the way that you can leverage these models and technologies to to automate your top of funnel processes so that you can reduce the influence that bias has in by shrinking that pipeline so that that humans do have the capacity to give uh, the time and attention needed to look at a student holistically. So when I was a recruiter, you know, you have thousands of names to go through. And without some assistance with, with that technology, it can be really hard to give them the time and attention. But if we can leverage technology to help automate, especially those top of funnel processes, we can eliminate those biases that are inherently in recruitment processes, uh, but technology can help mitigate those. Um, you know, when I was a recruiter, we were just bringing on Salesforce, for example. We had Banner. I could not use Banner to tell me where to focus my attention on any given day. But and now this was like 10, 12 years ago, right? Uh, and Salesforce was was coming into the higher ed space. And I just remember how it changed my day to day and the conversations I was having and what I was doing. And so I didn't let it make the decision ultimately, but I let it guide where to focus time and attention, right? But you have to audit those things to make sure you're not inherently promoting bias or perpetuating an outcome that you had no intention of of, of doing when you brought in the technology. Well, a different front, you know, I always like to ask people trends they're seeing, what they see on the horizon. And I guess whether these things are in tandem or not, like what has you excited for the future? You know, I'm an eternal optimist. So I like to hear what has people excited as they're, as they're looking ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, there's a lot that I can think of that I'm getting excited about, but while there's been this proliferation of data, I've also seen people just as interested in looking at the holistic picture of a person and recognizing data's limits. You know, we have to think about wellness. We have to think about mental health. We have to think about that component of belongingness. And people are thinking about ways to try to capture data qualitative or quantitative to tell us that story. And so I'm excited for what AI can do in the future to help us bring together a holistic view by looking at letters of recommendation and transcripts and portfolios and kind of compiling that all together to give us a a rich uh, outlook. AI just has a lot of really exciting possibilities uh, in the future. And if if we use it well, I think in particular in higher ed, there's this really exciting increase in in dual enrollment with high school students. And we're seeing that that's changing the face of community colleges. I think that's a good thing in that we're we're getting high schoolers on a track towards some type of post-secondary attainment or interest and exposure to that. So I'm excited to see how we can kind of close that gap between our K-12 system and our continuing education systems so that we really promote lifelong learning and we use data to then follow that student along the way. You know, think in the future, you have your data backpack or as a high school student, you have your entire K-12 portfolio of works in a digital record that you can share with employers or with colleges and it just helps you tell your story and, and you're logging your credentials and your skills that you're learning along the way. We have to figure out how to capture all of that. We can't capture everything, but we're getting closer to it every day. And it's exciting to see some of the ways that we're creatively using technology and data to reach students in innovative ways. I was reading an article about how some higher ed institutions and states are saying, wait a minute, why are we having students apply to schools? The state, we already have a lot of their data. Why don't we flip the admissions process? And use that data we have about them to say, look, based on what we know about you, you would be a great fit at this institution. Here's an acceptance package and financial aid already to you. I mean, I was a first-generation college student. I didn't even know what a credit hour was. 
And if it weren't for the people around me talking about college, I never would have, I probably wouldn't have even engaged in it because it was like intimidating and scary and unknown. So like, what could something like that do for a kid who thought college was unaffordable, unattainable, or they weren't smart enough, whatever the reason, what would it look like for them to get an acceptance packet from Indiana University unbeknownst to them? That seems pretty cool, right? Just to remove those barriers altogether. Yeah, I mean, and that would be such a like amazing sort of like, obviously, it's, it's all the public sector of a state or whatever, like K through 12 and higher ed working really closely together. Because I think it's also the, the notion where like students will kind of dogpile in the like more known names or, you know, the ones that are going to have the prestige. So if like an institution that sort of like metaphorically is like off the beaten path, but could be again, like a really great fit for the this, this student and the institution can provide some great, you know, scholarships or whatever else it just like can broaden like one almost like introduce a student to the notion of going to college in the first place if they weren't really considering it but then like widen their scope to consider potentially a lot more institutions because it's like wow okay like you you know me you know i'd be successful you're offering a very competitive package versus like everybody dogpiling on like you know the flagship school it's like well maybe i do go to like you know the satellite campus because it's still gonna say that i went to you know whatever state university so like those sort of dynamics and then like so yeah i love like direct admissions i think that is a really positive trend and then like that dual enrollment piece because i think like we're seeing that that is like something that can work and i'm excited to see it work even better because i think it's the idea that like people are grabbing onto it and then it's like let's make sure again in a public system of k-12 and higher education the transferability of those credits that people are getting and you know what are we providing and all that so those are definitely things because it's like you know the best that we've had to offer, I'd be like in decades past is like, I don't know, just take AP exams. If, you know, the school even offers a class to try to nurture that. And then like, even that doesn't have like direct, you know, transferability depending on where you go and everything. So if it's like building someone's confidence and taking like a college level course, or at least getting more clear, like line of credits that you could take somewhere. Yeah. Those are all good things. And I think just to your point, like can be made better by leveraging like a smart data and kind of maturing or evolving the infrastructure that like any public system of education is utilizing in a state. Yeah, absolutely. We don't consume government services or really any other services in a single siloed fashion. You know, so much of what we consume is like how we consume information on our phones. It's given to us. It's served up to us. It's plotted out. It's automated. Now with that comes obviously, you know, the big brother the theories, but um, it, it's just exciting to think about how we can make that a seamless integration and uh, just provide more opportunities for people. You know, if, if you know you want to be a nurse, you may not know where should you go to school or what is the best course of action to reduce your likelihood of debt. Like you just, you fall to the whim of what's in your mailbox and where your friends are going. And sometimes that's not always the best thing right at the end of the day. So, you know, I know there's this looming fear in higher ed of the, the enrollment cliff, how we're going to do, how we're going to respond. And I think some innovative things like flipped admissions can help diversify how colleges recruit and reach students, lessen your reliance on buying names from SAT, ACT. You know, the number of students taking those tests anyway is declining, right, as they're not becoming required. And start thinking about some new innovative ways to use data and challenge some old assumptions for how we've done things in the past. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because, yeah, it's even just that idea, like, yeah, people send out mailers directly to people, like direct mail. But the idea of, like, not having it just be like, oh, apply to us or do whatever. Like, and it's like not personalized. Yeah, you're just buying names. You're just blasting things out. It's like, yeah, taking that more sort of thoughtful, personalized approach. Yeah, I think it'd be really amazing to see more, more institutions do. But um, we will wrap up as we always do. If you have a final thought or call to action for everybody listening about this topic to end the episode with. Yeah, yeah, thanks. You know, I would say you, if you're an institution looking to modernize, transform, you know, it can be daunting to know where do I even start? You know, I don't even know maybe where I am today, and let alone how to get to that end result of transformation or or innovation, interoperability. These are all really big terms. And, and like so often we do in education, we use them so often, but don't lose sight of the value in engaging in 
internal or inviting external partners in the deep thought about data strategy and how you're going to use data is it as it pertains to your people and your process that will just make everything else fit in seamlessly and integrate and save you a lot of headache and a lot of pain when after the fact you're like oh well yeah i want to know xyz question well our data systems aren't set up to do that so if that little bit of time at the forefront of investing in good strategy and thought leadership will save you so much time and money down the road. It's so easy just to be like, I'm going to buy that product and plop it right in. Just do the future self, your future self a favor and invest in, in some, some kind of exercise to, to think about those things up front. Yeah, very good call to action because I think, yeah, that's that's where we're at right now is like no shortage of, yeah, the bright, shiny new tools and whatever else. So you got to have the good strategy to support it. And yeah, it's a, I think a way to help have, you know, things in your tool belt to navigate this very ambiguous time that is ahead for higher education. So that is uh, great stuff. I'd appreciate you hanging out and sharing all that you did and we'll have ways to uh, uh, connect with you and results in, in the description of the episode. So um, yeah, just appreciate your time. Hey, y'all, Zach here from Enrollify. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month and we've got a plethora of marketing, admissions, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks that are all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. Our shows feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Mickey Baines, Jeremy Tears, Jamie Hunt, Corinne Myers, Jamie Gleason, and many, many more. You can learn more about the Enrollify Podcast Network at podcasts.enrollify.org. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea. Find yours at podcasts.enrollify.org.